record um, so that uh, so that Anybody can, that uh, can't join in can watch it, or, or if, of course, if you want to watch it again, you'll be able to do so. Um, shortly, we're gonna hear from, from Peter Sprague um, and what it was like literally to, to save Aston Martin. Um, after a while, I'll open the floor to questions. Um, if, you, uh, if, if you're, at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a uh, reactions uh, button. If you click on that, you can raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, and of course, I'll, I'll invite people to, to ask their questions in the order that, that they arrive. And if you just say where you're from, that would probably be very helpful as well. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, let me introduce Peter Sprague. Hello, Peter. Hi, everybody. I don't know how many we're going to have. Uh, it's too few. We'll break out the wine earlier. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'm just very glad to be doing this. I'm going to use up a couple of two, uh, minutes on a technique I've learned on Zoom which is my UK friends never use their hands. And that's another part, but if you sit looking grim, so remember that you can do thumbs down, thumbs up, you know, slice throat or anything that you can imagine. But my Italian friends, you can't stop them from using their hands. So I was joking with uh, Andrew that I was busy saving a company in Klagenfurt, Austria run by a Sicilian named Massimo Di Bella. And he would drive about 100 miles an hour down the autostrada or the autobahn. And he would talk on the phone and gesture with his hands while steering with his knees to the recipient of the phone call in Malaysia and smoke a cigarette. Um, I don't ever rem remember relaxing completely under those circumstances. <laughs> People say we can't multitask. There you go. Uh, he could multitask. Uh, I just panicked. <laughs> so, as, as as you know, this uh, this session is really learning more about Peter's background and, and a very illustrious background in Aston Martin history. That is. So, let's get straight to it, Peter. Uh, okay. How did, how did you how did you get involved in the whole Aston Martin thing back in nineteen seventy four or five? I uh, was watching television on uh, Christmas Day. And Walter Cronkite, who is a famous commentator, came out with a black tie, which he never did for people, but he did for the Aston Martin Car Company. And he said he was sad to report that Aston Martin had closed on Christmas Eve and wasn't going to reopen. So I came down grumbling. And after I grumbled for a couple of hours, my wife said to me, well, why don't you go do something about it? And uh, so I had a friend over Christmas and he found the name, he got Rex Woodgate on the call and we called up, the, he called up, got the connection with the manager, then the recently retired managing director. And I said, well, I'd love to come over and just visit. So I showed up around January 3rd. I sometimes described this as being a, uh, an American Boy Scout without a clue. But I might add to that that uh, I was a little like the uh, ad by Richard Branson, who I always greatly admired, when he advertised Virgin Airlines, more experience than the name implies. <laughs> and so actually, uh, but I don't, I'm gonna just dwell on this for about three or four minutes. I'm perfectly open to questions later on. I'm just gonna, I was told to tell stories for a few minutes. But I, uh, by the time I got to England, I was 36, got to Newport Pagnell, but I was already chairman of a company called National Semiconductor, which I found in receivership in an abandoned hat factory in uh, Danbury because President Kennedy refused to wear hats. And the result was the hat industry died. And so we were moved into that and it was in receivership. and. Uh, I got involved with that and two years later I was chairman and by the time I got to England in 75 uh, I'd been on the chairman for seven years and we were on the New York Stock, Stock Exchange. Uh, I'd also gone through two other bankruptcies with a company called Advent which was in large screen televisions and loudspeakers and a company called Design Research which was a precursor to Conran's in England 
it was modern home furnishings and we represented Mary Mecco in Finland. I'd also started a company in agriculture in Iran, which got taken over by the Ayatollahs in 79. And uh, so I'd had a fair amount of business experience and uh, independent of that, I, I was a fairly adventurous kid. So I, I was in school in Switzerland and I managed to, I worked for the summer job as a newspaper correspondent. And uh, when the Hungarian revolution broke out, I decided that was something I had to see. So I flew to Vienna and hitchhiked to Budapest in the middle of the revolution, got caught by the Russians and nothing much happened and that was fine. But that got me a job when I was in university. I worked for United Press in Moscow and I took photographs of Khrushchev and Nixon and the debates and the centerfold of Look Magazine. And the following year, I actually uh, took my new bride to uh, outer Mongolia where we were the third and fourth Americans into Mongolia. So I had a fairly adventurous background and uh, a friend of mine named Jan Dauman, who may be on the call, actually called the Dorchester to see where, if whether I'd checked in on January 3rd. He knew I had a bad habit of looking for trouble. So that was that. So why did I show up? Uh, I had an Aston Martin. I'd bought used. It was a Pacific Green show car. And, I, and then it became the demo and then I bought it. And that was a family car. And actually I had the same combination of cars as Claire Gardner, who was another vice president in this comm exercise. Uh, Claire had an Alfa Romeo and the family car was a DB4 convertible. My DB4, sadly enough, wasn't a convertible but we already had one kid in the family was outgrowing the Alfa Romeo. And um, the, uh, I put a lot of mileage on it because my wife was at Harvard and I was at Yale. So I drove back and forth, which was kind of like driving back and forth between Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, I learned whatever automotive mechanics I've ever learned, which is not much by driving the Alfa Romeo, which, reminded me of why Fiat is called Fiat. Somebody said, fix it again, Tony. <laughs> so anyway, with the Alpha, it, uh, so we started having more kids and we needed a family car. So the Aston became the family car. And we put a piece of wood in the back with three inches of foam rubber. And eventually we loaded four kids on top of the foam. Uh, and eventually we got a bigger car, but the, uh, Alfa Romeo was appropriate. I had a Giulietta and then a Giulietta Spider Veloce, which had about twice the horsepower as my BMW motorcycle. And it was about the perfect car for me because it was well within my limitations as a driver. I love driving as fast as the car will go. And if you get an Aston Martin, you've got a problem. With an Alfa Romeo, it's not as much of a problem. So anyway, it... Uh, so that was actually an even funnier story is that uh, I, uh, my first year at Yale, when I had the Alpha, they wouldn't let me drive because freshmen weren't allowed to drive. Uh, but I got a pilot's license about the same time that I got my driver's license. And so we took over the flying club there. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was perfectly all right for me to drive my bicycle out to the airport to be able to fly home, but I couldn't drive. So it was either flying or hitchhiking, depending on the weather. All of which is miscellaneous, you know, background. Why am I here now? Somebody asked me, uh, when were you last involved in Alpha, Aston Martin? And I said, about 41 years ago. And practically every day for the last five months, both of which are accurate. Uh, in between, uh, when I stopped being chairman of the company, I describe it as putting my wings in the sock drawer, and I got on with my life. I mean, we uh, let's, uh, let's 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 fill in some of that gap between, shall we? So. You, you, you've come down, your, your wife's pointed out that, the, uh, that you stopped grumbling about, about the, the company going bust. Um, 
So what happened next? You you jumped on a plane to to the UK, if I'm right, and then and then it all started. Well, the story is in the is I wrote the story up. If you go to spread.com, which is just my last name, uh, Don uh, Rose and Nick Candy, uh, who had an Aston Martin magazine for North America called Vantage Point, and they insisted I write a history. So I wrote a history. I checked with them last week to see if anybody had ever complained about the history, and they said no, <laughs> but they did a very good job editing. So okay. the story's in there, but the reality was uh, I did show up and around the third or fourth, and I did stay overnight at the Dorchester, and what was left of the factory sent a car to pick me up, which I hadn't anticipated, and I arrived when there were about 15 or 20 uh, members of the British press, a scrum of the paparazzi. And I wasn't expecting that. I mean, I just thought I could go up. I'd never actually been inside the factory. I'd been there, but I wasn't important enough to get inside. And uh, I figured I'd at least get that done. And uh, what had happened is the managing director, in order to create some excitement in the hope that somebody would want to come along and save Aston Martin, had released a, a press release saying that an American was coming over to save the company. That's all they knew. And boy, was I in trouble. Because they looked at me and they said, who are you? And I said, I'm not anybody. I mean, I basically was trying to escape because I knew that <laughs> if I said who I was, I was going to be in real trouble. And so I remained nobody. <laughs> and I toured the factory. Finally got, got accomplished. But it was a pretty dismal scene. Because people left that night on Christmas Eve in 74, expecting to come back to work the day after New Year's. The equipment was there. The cars were there. Everything was a work in progress. They had no warning. They came back and the building was locked. And there's something sad about any factory that's locked that way, but Aston was a different thing because you had all these beautiful objects in various stages of development and what have you. So I had my tour and I went back to London thinking I'd escaped the paparazzi. And the, I made the cover of a few newspapers, including the whole front cover of, I think, the Daily Telegram. It wasn't, no, it, was, it wasn't the Daily Mail, but it was something like the Daily Mail. It's in the article. And it was, <laughs> it was classic British journalism of the paparazzi variety. It said, millionaire to the rescue. And there was a picture of me with a pipe and a beard. <laughs> and uh, the article started off, an American millionaire turned the, turned the Aston Martin factory today. Oh, no, no, excuse me. An American without a name. It said millionaire to the rescue. And then an, an American without a name toured the Aston Martin factory today. So how they connected me with a million it was probably true in Pesetas. <laughs> probably was true in Lyra. Uh, at that particular moment, in time, it wasn't true in dollars. National Semiconductor stock was down and what have you. But uh, why did I not need that? Because I had a lot of friends in London. I finished making a movie called Steppenwolf with Max von Sydow and Dominique Sanda. And we finished the movie in London at a studio and did the music. I had a lot of friends in London. So my anonymity was going to be difficult to maintain if I managed to make the front page a few national newspapers. So eventually I had a press conference and I decided to just stick it out and find out why it couldn't be done. I just was gonna sit around for two or three weeks. I remember sitting in the cold in the little tiny building on Newport Pagnell that was our headquarters. I've forgotten what they called it, but somebody knows what it was called. Sunny and side. Uh, what? Sunny side? I think so, yeah, something like that. And the, 
it was cold. Among other things, the receiver who worked for William Wilson uh, decided one of the ways he could save money uh, was to turn the heat off, <laughs> uh, which made me more and more irritated. But I thought if I got the numbers, it was gonna turn out to be obvious that it couldn't be done. And then I would have a sort of organized presentation as to why an intelligent business person would look at this and say, it can't be done. And then everybody would decide I hadn't come over just to collect publicity. I'd actually come over to do something useful. And the more time I spent there, the more irritated I got with the receiver, uh, mostly because it was cold <laughs> and, the, uh, and other things. And I still couldn't figure out why it couldn't be done. And it was fascinating because later on when I got, I spent five or six months looking for a partner. I had no real understanding of what England was like at that time. But 1975 was not a good time for England. No. Uh, I think the FTSE was at 100. These numbers may be wrong. I didn't double check them today, but it was close. You could buy a Muse house walking, five minute walk from the Connaught for about 70,000 pounds. I wish I had. Um, you know, all they needed was an optimistic American bounding around town saying, save Aston Martin. And there were just more important things on most people's minds. And I asked a lot of people uh, from uh, one of the, I, I think it was Jarvis Rockwell, uh, Rothschild, uh, who gave me a, Jacob Rothschild, who gave me a really fair hearing and said, come back tomorrow. And he looked at it and he said, I love what you're doing and I wish you the best of success, but I don't think it can be done. He was about the only person who was kind and nice enough to actually let me come back and have a hearing. And eventually he discovered I had a business in Iran. So he had 5,000 white trucks. It was a company called White, white as in black, red, and white uh, that he was stuck with in Saudi Arabia and wanted to know if I had Iranian connections on which I could unload 5,000 trucks to which I had to reply. No, I couldn't do that either. So I disappointed him and he disappointed me. But I really respected the way he handled it. And so I, I went running around. Um, I don't remember if we had a business. We didn't really have a business plan like a, a VC would ask for today. Um, but um, the longer I got involved in it, the more belligerent I became because I just... I don't like no very much. And uh, that was when the Beatles were producing a movie called Yes. Yes was the big thing. And I was looking for yes. Yes was in short supply. So I went looking for yes. And eventually, uh, oddly enough, one of the people who said yes, that he would help me was William Wilson. I've never really said this before, and he kind of was an, almost a villain in my history, and I'd like to go back and replace it. Yes, he ran it into bankruptcy. Yeah, yes, he went home with the, uh, you know, some of the trophies. Uh, yes, there were people who didn't really, oh, good God, I've got messages showing up. Yes, he went home with the trophies and what have you. But I went and stayed with him sometime in July or June. I stayed at his house. Uh, I'd like to say I let him beat me at ping pong. It's possible he just beat me at ping pong, but we'll leave that alone. But he could have, my secretary discovered that he had announced that the company was going to be, assets were going to be required by some polite sounding you know, William Blake Inc. And we tracked it back to Cadillac Machinery in Detroit, who were an industrial liquidator. And there were at the time 60 partially completed cars. There were hundred and was two million seven in work in progress. There was about a million seven in parts. There was a service business that made a quarter of a million pounds a year. Uh, there were the buildings. Uh, all of which he controlled. 
And if he'd walked off and done what he said he was going to do, he, uh, thanks, I'm just sorry to be getting rid of stuff that's bothering me here. Sorry. If he'd done that, uh, he would have netted three or four million pounds. But he had said to the British press that if a, some kind of a viable alternative came along, he would support it. And I'd gotten to know a number of the British press because they were following me because there wasn't pretty much like that day in January, there wasn't a lot of news around. So, and whatever it was, it was kind of amusing to follow the exercise. And uh, he, I arranged with my friends in the press to call him up at his home and ask him point blank, if there was this group that was trying to save the company, why was he standing in the way? And at the end of the time, he basically said, okay, go for it. Um, I could have pulled off the same stunt. I could have bought it, immediately started liquidating. Um, it just would have meant that I never would have been able to land in London again. <laughs> it would have been a very sad occasion. But whatever it was, uh, to his credit, uh, he could have stopped it. And then there was a thing I described, which was fascinating. And it's the only time I ever got involved in lawyers with Aston Martin, period. And in fact, my involvement with lawyers in general is minimal. I have never sued anybody. I've been sued a couple of times, but it took two years and cost a lot of money. And I won. At the end of it, you said you just spent a lot of money and so what? Because during those two years, the problem we were trying to solve never got fixed. So the lawyer came from Slaughter and May. I thought I could always remember that name. Slaughter we might, slaughter it we may. And he was a distinguished gentleman. And um, we got outside of Solihull in the rain where William Wilson had an office. And for some reason, we didn't get out of the rain. It was just sprinkling and it was cold, despite being the summer. I think it was, yeah, it was in August. It wasn't that cold, but it was, yeah, it was cold and it was rainy. And I had a check. I'd borrowed 600,000 pounds from the Bank of America against the 60 completed cars. That's 10,000 pounds a piece. So there wasn't a lot of risk in that. The receiver had 300,000 pounds in his drawer. So we let them keep that. And I had a check for 195,000 pounds, which turned out to be the purchase price, which is somewhat similar to buying a new Aston now, except we got the whole damn company with mixed results. And just as we were about to finish the transaction, the lawyer from Slaughter and May said, you can't close. This is my lawyer telling me that I can't close in the rain outside of Sally Hall in a parking lot. It turns out my check was a cashier's check on the Bank of America. I mean, a bank check on the bank itself, but it's not a British clearing bank. And because it wasn't a British clearing bank, what happened if the, if we, the Bank of America went bankrupt over the weekend? And therefore, uh, the transaction wasn't good because the check wasn't acceptable. I spent a fair amount of time discussing whether the bank, uh, if it was going to go bust, and uh, turned out it didn't. But I got in a 20-minute argument with a lawyer, maybe longer, in which I basically said, guys, can we close subject? Can we close with one last condition, which is, if the Bank of America is out of business on Monday and the check doesn't clear, the deal's off. At which point I got a long lecture on the fact that closing can't be subject to anything. I mean, guys. <laughs> anyway, we prevailed and I went back and there were five or six guys that I'd gotten to know at the company. And Alan Curtis was there and George Minden and 
the Alan Curtis story, I had to go back and remember this. If you're telling your own history, you tend to forget the other people. This Churchill once commented when he was writing the history of World War II, said, if you want to look good in history, write it yourself. So to a certain extent, I'm afraid that that's always going to be present in storytelling. But whatever it was, uh, we broke open some champagne. But I have to tell you, it was not a totally uh, a total moment of great triumph. There was a general sense of, oh, my God, what are we going to do in the morning? <laughs> Let me come in there, Peter, because um, you've um, you, you've clearly high, high outlined for us a you know a, a very big picture of what happened. And one of the things that the themes that seems to come through from what you've just said to me, or so what you've just said to us, is that um, you know both yourself and William Wilson, you may have not had the strongest business case ever. But, but there's something perhaps in the heart or the emotion that's driving this forward and stopping William Wilson asset stripping and it's making you keep going. Is, is, that, is that accurate or is there more to this than, than just the rational argument? There are no rational arguments for doing what I did or he did. Uh, my favorite cartoon was in the Daily Mail on the front cover the day after I supposedly, you know, I bought the company and it showed a little boy praying beside his bed it's in the article and his mother was hovering over him and he was kneeling in prayerful position beside his bed. And she said, you needn't include Aston Martin tonight, dear. It's being saved. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but there is no question. You get involved in this. I mean, the, the history of the company, the whole mythology, the, uh, incidentally, there would have been no company to save if James Bond hadn't been created by, you know, created and drove an Aston. I mean, it, I actually, about six months before he died, had dinner in a space in a restaurant called Flitty and Sean Connery was there having dinner with somebody. And Lydia Bassanach, who's very famous, was actually serving the tables. And this was one of her many restaurants. And there was another couple and I wanted to go over and shake his hand and say, you know, there are two people in this room who saved Aston Martin. And without you, I couldn't have done it. And then I realized that the guy was having a pleasant lunch. And I thought I would leave him alone. I'm still mixed about that. But it, uh, in reality, I mean, the history of this company, there were Americans involved before. I mean, Wilbur Gunn was an opera singer who had a penchant for building motors and I think he put them on boats and then he put them in a car. The Laganda is an American Shawnee Indian word for swift running. Currently running down this somewhere in Ohio is, is a, I think it's called Bucks Creek. I mean, when you look at the whole history, it's a quintessential British car company. I mean, it's not supposed to win Le Mans, but then again, uh, Sterling Moss wasn't an Italian. And James Bond wasn't, you know, French. So you look at it and you look at everybody, you end up, you, you, you do it and you're responsible. I mean, this is no game. The reality is a lot of people have invested, if everybody on this call has invested in time and energy way beyond having a piece of four wheel transportation in the backyard. Uh, you know, transportation, trade it in every two or three years and move on. We're all stuck with Aston Martins that are beyond transportation in our mind and our hearts and our, our will. And so it turns out that, uh, yeah, was this a logical business deal? There is no way in any time that I can think of where this was a logical business deal. I actually got out alive. I pretty much broke even. The world turned sour in 79. Everything I touched, I lost the Iranian business, which was valued at 27 billion, at one million, M, million, of which I own 20%. We had 27,000 tons of coal storage. The Shah was overthrown. Price of gasoline went to $5 here. We're complaining now it's at four. Check that out for inflation. That's the equivalent of about 10 or more. Uh, same thing happened in England. Uh, the, uh, uh, 
we needed to sell five cars. We had a deal with the workforce. Alan and I came up with a brilliant managerial decision. I'm just let you know that we occasionally came up with brilliant managerial decisions. Uh, we actually went out and told the workforce we lost money at five and we made a little bit of money at six cars. So every time they made six cars, we'd put 20% more in the pay packet at the end of the week. And occasionally we started making six cars. But my experience with the average management is they don't tell the workforce, what is the condition of the company? Oh my God, the little people who just go and do all the hard work aren't supposed to be included in discussions where the big managers actually do things. Which incidentally, is, I'll just insert this from the side and then I'm about to shut up and give relief to everybody. But the, uh, it's a lot easier to save a bankrupt company than it is to start one. <clears throat> because to start one, you have to find good people. When you've got a going company with three or 400 people, there are good people. They're always good people. You have to find them, but they're there. Uh, they're gen if there's a problem, the problem is usually at the top. There are an amazing number of people who are just are good, but they've stuck it out. And when you start straightening the place out, they've got a lot of bright ideas. In fact, we got we asked the troops for suggestions. We got 2,605 engineering change orders. I mean, literally, I, it's in the story, but there was a guy who was welding on a piece of gear on the, some, on the chassis with great craftsmanship. And his mate next door, this line moved about once a day. You can figure out if you make six cars a week, it moves every six hours. His mate took it off. And then he had tea four or five times a day and fried fried fish, uh, fish and chips on Friday. So you never wanted to buy a Friday car because the car that went out and drove around for testing came back as the fish and chips delivery wagon for us. And he'd take the bracket off. They wouldn't mention to management this bracket was useless. Nobody remember what it was for. They wouldn't mention it to man management because maybe one or both of them would be made redundant. So they lived on welding it with craftsmanship and taking it off with craftsmanship, whatever it was. So if you basically trust people, you'll find a team of people that you can put together, provided you face up to the reality that some things have to be fixed. And the things that have to be fixed are usually the, the problems at the top for one reason or another. But uh, once you fix, those problems and to everybody else in the place, the problems are obvious. Uh, you look fairly intelligent to those people because you basically listen to them. And then you do something. You actually follow up and do something. And so they looked at Alan Curtis and Alan played a much more active role than I did because I was in England about one week a month and he was driving his Woody he had a mini a Morris Minor Woody, which the whole factory was so embarrassed about that finally they wouldn't give him the MOT. Uh, they wouldn't check it out for safety. I think he then had to buy something, and I think he ended up eventually with an Aston. But his great passion was flying, and he flew a bulldog, which is where the name of the bulldog comes from. But it, in every case, people are there and if you listen then you're going to learn a great deal and you don't have to bring a lot of knowledge in the knowledge is there you have to bring in curiosity and you have to care a lot and so that goes back to your original question yeah aston martin is not a logical process it's never been a logical process i don't think any of the people who've been involved in it would really go on the mat with me to argue about why this makes a lot of sense. But it's a wonderful thing to do and your love life gets involved in it. 
<laughs> before before we open the floor to questions, and, and please, if if you have, I'm sure you have some questions piling up about all kinds of things. I mean, Peter just mentioned the bulldog, which may well be a question that someone's waiting to ask. Uh, go to the bottom of the bottom of your screen, press the reactions, uh, and and then uh, raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, meanwhile, I'll ask you one more, Peter, to to, to cue those up. Um, you mentioned that uh, you know ch the church was famous quote about uh, if you know if you want to be remembered in history, write it yourself. Which which bits of the Aston Martin history? Uh, your your involvement in Aston Martin history um, are you perhaps proudest of and maybe most disappointed by as well? Uh, I certainly, having all the involvement I had in the electronics world, uh, if I'd spent more time, brought in other people, uh, we might have done a better job on the you know Lagonda electronics. Uh, we uh, we didn't set the goal clearly enough. You know, that's one of the things I may repeat a few times now is that uh, if you don't know where you're going, you're probably never going to get there. And we didn't explain clearly enough what we needed to accomplish. I mean, the whole way that was developed, uh, it was very early, but we ended up with a cable harness, the thickness of your wrist, and it could have been reduced to three wires. <laughs> uh it things like that uh i wasn't disappointed in 79 when i left because i always knew uh, we didn't have a long-term plan uh and when we dropped the three cars thank god i'd recruited victor gauntlet uh peter cadbury got involved uh peter levanos walked into our showroom age 26 and we looked at the name Levanos, and that sounded like British shipping and sounded like a lot of money. So we got Peter involved. And that got us a lot of money. Uh, it never could have survived making five or six cars. And so eventually Ford came in, and that was partly the charm and leadership of, of, uh, of Victor Gauntlet who has to have had the best name for an Aston chairman you can possibly remind, you know, imagine. And, uh, but I don't remember particular disappointments. I remember an enormous amount of fun. I mean, popping the Lagonda on the press when they didn't think we were actually doing anything. And we had a meeting at the inn and the Bell Inn at Aston Clinton and we showed the car. There was not even a rumor there was such a thing. We then swore them to silence that they couldn't, before Earl's Court, reveal what we'd done. The BBC, of all people, broke the news about two days early. We also told the press that it didn't run, didn't have a transmission. And all of a sudden, we were made total liars, because there on the BBC was the car running beautifully through the British countryside. They got the car, put it on the top of a hill, told us they were going to show this later, put a sandbag in the back to compensate for the weight, and rolled it down the hill through the beautiful British countryside. Well, everybody else said, you bastards. <laughs> you told us it didn't run. We see it run. Well, that was still a triumph. I mean, popping that car out at Earl's Court, and then we... Alan had created something that was a mini Aston Martin owners club called the Young Enthusiast Club. He got the idea because some kid sent us five pounds in an envelope. So Alan created the Young Enthusiast Club, which got you a actual membership card and a t-shirt. And I just read in the last few months, last three months, somewhere on the forum, somebody remembered that and how proud they were when they got to the stand that crowded there and his father couldn't get on the stand. And he brought his little card out and he held it up and took his father on the stand. And now guess what? The father owns an Aston Martin. Bravo. I mean, not the father, the kid owns the Aston Martin. And he's now somebody else's father which goes back again. The rest of it was all fun. I mean, with people were extraordinary. I started off living in an Egon Rone motel, the worst one in England. And then I lived in the Swan Revive. And then I got crashing privileges for three years at Woburn Abbey. 
which if you have to find some place to stay within 10 miles of the factory beats the hell out of the Swan Revive. <laughs> so anyway, it was all basically fun. And uh, it came to an end. And I was doing other things anyway. And uh, but I ended up like all such experiences, you end up with a few close friends. I mean, Philip Sober, who really was the managing partner of our accounting firm and did everything for us, uh, has become one of my closest friends. Out of every one of these adventures, you usually end up with fewer close friends than you think. You think you'll remember everybody. You're lucky if you end up with three or four out of any adventure like this that really become people you consider close friends. It's just the nature of the game. Okay, that's it. Let's have some questions <laughs> from somebody you. other than Andrew. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Andrew Sington, I think I saw your hand go up. Were you intend to ask a question or were you just waving at the screen? Uh, I may need translation, Andrew. What was the question? We can't hear you. No, I'm just trying to get you, get you, get you live, Pete. Uh, I can hear, but I don't hear clearly. Incidentally, I have a hearing problem. That's the business I'm in now. So, uh, oh, you is that better? Yes, go yes, ahead. Sir. So, I read your story last night. It's absolutely fascinating. Well, then you have been inflicted with it twice. <laughs> well, well, it's nice to know who actually wrote it. No, it was, I think the most important thing I'd like to know a bit more about is the bulldog. Uh, and boy, I wish Alan were on the call. And I talked, I wrote to Alan yesterday. Uh, the Bulldog was truly Alan's project. It was literally kept under a big sheet. Uh, it was named the Bulldog because his airplane was one of the two or three private aerobatic. It's used, a Bulldog is an aerobatic trainer used by the RAF. Uh, he had a civilian variant of it. Uh, he used to go up and scare the hell out of people. And uh, so that's why it got called the Bulldog. And obviously, the British connections to Bulldog. Uh, but uh, it was kind of, he financed it personally. And uh, he made a deal with William Towns. And uh, obviously, it's a Towns design. It looks like a Towns design. And uh, we got it together and sort of like the Laganda they built for me. I got there on a Wednesday and we couldn't make the payroll on a Friday. We sold the Laganda on a Thursday and we made the payroll. Uh, we were also in tough times, bulldog time. We sold it to some young Saudi, possibly a prince, but then there's a large number of princes. So don't get too excited. And, uh, that guy drove it to London and I don't think he knew how to get it out of first gear and he blew the engine. <laughs> uh, at which point we didn't have a lot of energy to fix it. Uh, Alan at this point has cancer of his vocal cords. He can't talk and I can hardly listen. So our conversations are by email. Uh, but Alan, uh, he's a, uh, to misquote Churchill, Ellen was a very modest guy with very little to be modest about. And uh, he just put his head down and did it. And uh, so the Bulldog was his favorite project. And we shed a tear when it blew up on the way to London. I don't really know the rest of its history, except I gather they've tracked it down. And they're gonna try and run it at better than 200 mile an hour somewhere. And my guess is it will do that. And uh, it's an artifact of history, uh, but I had nothing to do with it. Uh, it uh, set the peak under the sheets every once in a while. <laughs> you're allowed if you're chairman, you get to. Oh, I think you you had more influence than you perhaps pretend to. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> okay. Modesty is not my strong suit. <laughs> no, I can tell. I can tell. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Well, at least at least uh, allowing the companies to be there to build it, if nothing else. Yeah. Uh, Richard Purser, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, go ahead, please, if, you, if you're unmuted. That's John Purser. Sorry, John Purser. I do apologise. Yeah. yeah. Peter, Peter, can, can you take three questions, one after the other? 
Sure, John, and I remember meeting you over here. You were one of the few people from England. You were at one of the uh, the dinner in New York, which is yeah, the one thing right. I do every year. Yeah, that's the one. That was the last time I saw you, which was when we were saying uh, thank you very much to Susan. Uh, great, great day at the UN. I got I got through uh, U.S. customs by saying uh, they said, "Why are you coming here?" And I said. I'm making a speech at the United Nations tomorrow. And the guy said, oh, well, in which case, I'll stamp your passport really quickly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've dined out on that story the same as you've done on some of yours. One of which was, there was a story you told me and when we made you a vice president, um, you recounted it, that you had to borrow a pound from somebody to, finalized buying the company and you never paid it back to your friend and you actually threw him a pound coin on the day. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. I paid it back. <clears throat> but the funny story was that the friend was a guy named Jan Dauman, who he and I started working together when we were 23 years old. And at one point he was a number one engineering Right. Anyway, he was a very bright guy and speaks five languages and lives in London. Oh, so he was my he was the guy who called the Dorchester to see if I'd checked in. And I couldn't buy the company without permission of Her Majesty's government. As a foreigner. So I had to park the company with somebody. So uh, Jan gave me a pound. Uh, I gave Jan a how did it work out? Anyway, I think he gave me a pound and bought the company. He was holding it. And uh, I went to see the treasury. And we went down a list with a stiff looking bureaucrat checking off points. And we got to military implications. And I smiled at him and agreed that we would commit to not fit machine guns without permission of Her Majesty's government. <laughs> and he actually smiled clicked off the rest of it, uh, but I kind of forgot about Jan. So we went up to the barn, uh, the only time I've been there, which was, and I took Jan because it, I think it was before GPS and Jan knew how to navigate and I don't. So we found the barn and he told me the story. Uh, and I think I gave him 50p for his half of the company or whatever it was. And I think it's in a frame in the barn. If it's not, I can come up with another 50p, but it's quite correct for a while. Uh, I couldn't own the company and Jan Dauman did. Hopefully he's on the call. Um, go ahead, go ahead, John. <laughs> that answers the call, the question. I did get my pound back. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Right. Um, and it did go on the wall in the barn. I... Actually, if I can interrupt, Jan, you gave me the pound and I have it as a trustee and I'm going to put it in a frame and put it in the barn. We had a photograph of the three of us with you and uh, and um, Mr. Wood giving us the pound and I said, could I have it? And I haven't paid you back, so I owe you a pound as well. <laughs> oh, there's always hope, Jan, and I'm glad to see you. You are in the dark, uh, as happens often. <laughs> Anyway, so well, there's corroboration for the story. John, you had a third question, maybe. Yeah, it was really, um, when did George Minden um, get involved? And of course, um, were you around when Dennis Flather turned up with his briefcase and checkbook? Yeah, both are wonderful stories. Uh, George came over relatively early on, around March, and he had the Aston Martin dealership in, in uh, Toronto. He also owned the Windsor Arms Hotel. And he was a real car enthusiast. He had a R Bentley and various things. He knew vastly more about cars than practically anybody I know. And he uh, uh, expressed interest in saving the company to the press. He later admitted that part of the reason he did that is he was attempting to create enough again, ongoing interest that somebody else would do it. And uh, 
oh my God, here was competition for me uh, saving the company. So I called him up and said, I don't want to save the company, but can I help you? <laughs> and that's actually what happened. And he, uh, he eventually joined in and he should have played a more active role. He knew a lot more, but he was uh, spending about seven eighths of his time in Switzerland. That's, for some reason, I think his wife was not a very enthusiastic about anything to do with Aston Martin. And uh, so he never really had the time. Uh, he did come to most of the board meetings. I would have to say in light of the calm, which we'll get around to, uh, I don't believe we ever took minutes of any kind. I mean, we didn't even record the conclusions. We just basically got over, you know, we talked about it, figured out what we were going to do and remembered to do it. Dennis Flather got on the board pretty much the same way the little boy with the five pounds did. Dennis sent us a check for 50,000 pounds and said, I think you'll need this. And he was, you would know, John, he was in charge of a vintage car. Uh, he, he, he was back at the London to Brighton race kind of automobiles, the pre-1910 cars that were trying to beat the horse carriages to London to Brighton. And he was a wonderful man, but he sent us 50,000 pounds in a check. That was punchy. We basically reached the conclusion, you poor bastard, we'll put you on the board. <laughs> but he didn't ask for it. <laughs> and uh, he had a lot of fun ideas, including figuring out how to park a car by rolling it sideways by a device that came down under the wheel, which I think is about to be invented. Uh, he was a character, and uh, uh, but he had a touch to the turn of the century, the 19th century, you know, automobiles, and uh, I liked him a lot. He just was another one of those good people. He wrote me a letter when I put my wings in the drawer and said, uh, It'd have been fun knowing me, and I hoped we'd stay in touch. And we didn't, and that's my fault. I presume he's a lot older than I am, so he's probably not with us at this point. Sadly, sadly not. Yes, life is a series of accidents, uh, followed by one se severe one. But in the meantime, it's uh, uh, accidental encounters, and that was the story of everybody's life. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, John. And, uh, apologies again for calling you Richard. I used to have a colleague called Richard and uh, Richard Purser, so hence, hence my confusion. Um, Emma Squire or, or John Goldsmith? I guess one of you is next, you're just sitting next to each other. That's right, yeah. Uh, I just, Peter, I just wanted to, uh, to ask you, or not really to ask a question, but to bring you up to date on your DV4, because your DV4 apparently has been sitting in a uh, your old DB4, your green car, has been sitting in uh, a museum in America for a long time, but it's just come back to Europe and lockdown permitting in Belgium. I'm due to go and pick it up to recommission it uh, in a couple of weeks. So it'll be coming back to the UK uh, and I'll give you an update when we've... Uh, when we've uh, brought it back to life and got it started again, because it my wife, long, my long wife has, since you since you uh, sold it. My wife Tiasha has never forgiven me for selling that car. Uh, it has a sunroof that was put in by the factory. That's right. One time I went there and the factory didn't. It was a sort of a fabric sunroof, well, and uh, yeah. and uh, that was the time I went up there, but they wouldn't actually let me. I, I got into service, but I didn't get into the factory. But that was a uh, that was the family car for a number of years until uh, four little kids fit in the back of an Aston as long as they're all under nine. But uh, actually, Tiasha and I abandoned all four of them and took the Central Mountain Road of Afghanistan, in 1971, part of my practicing for adventures at Aston Martin. But she loved that car and. Uh, be nice to it. Pat it. I'll, send, I'll send you a picture when we get it. Thank when you. Did you. When did you actually? When did you actually sell it? Probably seventy-two or seventy-three. 
Okay. Uh, I'm a terrible person when it comes to maintenance of things. I mean, I belong to the school of thought of buy it and sell it in three years. Uh, my super cub, which weighed 1200, my super cub, we had to look after because, you know, the government checked on it every six months. But I've got about 1500 hours flying a 1200 pound airplane. But it got maintained because it lived in a hangar. <laughs> As an, as an aside, Alan Curtis used to own Compton Abbas, and that's where I keep my aircraft now. Uh, he got me a ride in a uh, Tiger Moth, Compton Abbas, which compared to my Super Cub, my Super Cub is practically a 747 compared to Tiger Moth. I mean, the Tiger Moth felt like flying a wet leaf and being a bug, and if you ran to the right side, you tilted to the right, and if you ran to the left side. <laughs> but anyway, I did manage to lout. I survived the Tiger Moth, and you think people started that way, and 40 hours later were flying Spitfires. It, uh, what a fun, I mean, yeah, that fun times at Aston Martin, a lot of them didn't take place at the factory. They took place in, around that. Did you know Alan? Yeah, yeah, no, Alan, uh, he's writing a book, and he, because I was chairman of the club, he got hold of me, and we've had a lot of conversations about four years three or four years ago and he came down and in fact i was involved when i was with the club with he's very much into the parachute regiment and we did a big event with aston martins and parachutes at old sarah Airfield. i saw that on a card recently that he was obe as a result of that i saw the uh i thought he was mostly involved in the, he was sort of honorary member of the battle of britain well the, they, they put him into effort. some kind of a position on that yeah. Uh, he he was a he would have been in the Battle of Britain if he'd been younger. <laughs> he would have done very well at it. First class guy. What know. kind of a plane do you fly? I've got a, an American uh, Enridge FAA um, Piper uh, T tail Piper Piper twenty uh, twenty eight two hundred T tail. Okay. Arrow, yeah. arrow four. Arrow four. All right. Well, I'm, I mine's a P eighteen. Uh, okay, there we go. I, I had a one, I had a 57 one, and it uh, got swept up in a water wind spout in uh, Florida, took up, broke the ropes and dropped it on its nose. And so I got a, a PA-18. I am uh, I actually sold the plane as well this spring because I wasn't flying it. And uh, uh, the guy said, well, anytime I came back, as long as my rating was up, I could fly it. Then the bastard put it on pontoons. Oh. And I've only flown it on pontoons a couple of times. I suppose I could sue him for you know, <laughs> reneging on the changing the plane in such a way that I can't fly it. But you said you'd never sued anybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it would take two years, a couple of hundred thousand dollars, and by That's that right. time he'd have sold the plane to somebody else. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's a wonderful story. Give Alan my well. I talked to Alan. I mean, I communicated with him yesterday. I thought he could come on this because. I um, haven't spoken to him for a while, and please give him my regards when you speak to him next. Well, I'd love to talk to you further about his book. I'd love to know how his view of it, you know, is, is different from mine, because I'm sure it is different. Yeah, well, I mean, we haven't seen it yet, so, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'd look forward to that as well. Okay. So well, push him hard, because that's what I wouldn't have done mine without Don Rose and Nick Candy. Sorry. Yeah. Somewhere in that exchange of, uh, of aircraft discussion was the mention of a 747, which gives me a neat segue to introduce Mark Donahue, who's got, has had his hand up for a while and is a 7, uh, 747 pilot. So over to you, Mark. Well, hardly a pilot. I, I've flown one. Um, this is actually going back to Aston Martin, if that's all right. And I know we're late and we've probably only got a couple of minutes left. But uh, just a question really to, to Peter, who is the father of the Lugonda. Now, Peter, you called me about a month or so ago and we were chatting away um, about my... Uh, interesting buying one of the very early in the conversation you said mark please apologize to all your friends for what i did inventing the Lagonda and coming up with the idea of all these electronics i made a big mistake and i said no peter on the contrary your invention your uh, uh, idea of having this car was iconic and the estimate Lagonda is part of the history of of the company what's all that about that yeah and Somebody's got a smoke alarm, and I haven't even got my pipe going. Your dinner's ready, Peter. Um, can you possibly, just for um, no more than two hours, talk about the Lugonda? 
Oops. Somebody hit their mute button because I've got a huge noise and it's not coming from. Sorry about this. Uh, it's going to mute everybody. It's trying to stop it. Apologize there. Somebody's microphone must be on. It's causing feedback. So I've muted everybody. So I'm just going to. Uh, okay, well, I'm on. The, the question was about Lagonda. Yeah, Peter, just if you could possibly talk for no more than less than two hours, please, about the Lagonda before we close the call. Yeah, well, I'd like to stay on a little while longer because I'd really like to get to the subject that, you know, started this whole thing off. And it'd be, you know, the calm and what have you. Other people may not want to get on it, but the fact of the matter is, I was asked by Bob Welch. And I discovered I was a vice president, which I didn't know. And I discovered I had a vote, which I didn't know. And then I discovered I'm on a vice president's committee. And all of a sudden, I've been spending an hour or two a day for the last five months on the damnedest exercise I've ever been involved in. And I'd love to stop doing that. And I'd love to bring that subject up. But uh, so the Lagonda, the whole decision, incidentally, nothing was minuted ever. <laughs> which makes it easy to remember. Uh, I think the whole thing took two days. Uh, Mr. Towns drew up a, a drawing. It was a little complicated because we've been told by the dealer in LA that we needed to have a convertible V8 or we couldn't sell them. And it had to have an automatic top. The engineer said that was gonna be very difficult. Alan figured out how to do it for 5,000 pounds and some wooden parts made out of oak. And it went up and down. But the Lagonda uh, was there and we took a look at it. I've forgotten, all of us took a look at it. Within less than two days, it was, let's go for it. There was no market survey or study of you know what would happen or we didn't get 20 people involved to contemplate what it might be. And then when you get somebody like a William Towns, he pretty much, he and the engineers built it because designs don't improve by having 11 people paint the Mona Lisa. You know, one person's in charge of the smile and the other's in charge of the dress. I mean, give me a break. So that was a very easy management situation. Once we decided to do it, we said, guys, do it. A little brutal. And if you have a clear vision of where you're going, and you spell that out and you trust people, they did it. And uh, I remember only the th only thing we had was meddling on the hood on ornament. George said it's got to have a hood ornament uh, to position the nose and what have you. I, I remember in 75, somebody offered me 600 hood or ornaments for 10,000 pounds. That would have been an investment. But I felt sympathetic for all the cars whose Anyway, we didn't have a hood ornament, but whatever it is, I have, I, you know, all we basically did was back it because we had a bunch of people who believed in it. And uh, other than the electronics, which was fun. Uh, and I, looking back at it, it's one of the few things where I could have made a bigger contribution. I probably should have beaten up on National Semiconductor harder because it would have been good for them as well. Um, so I, uh, I just like the idea that the decision was quick and obvious. And, you know, with despite all the problems, it's, we got uh, 600 and some odd Lagondas built. 645. 645? Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember, I have to say that, uh, that uh, Lord Tavistock really was a diplomat. If you describe a diplomat as a person who goes out, an honest man who goes out and lies for his country because he got the earliest one and we had two mechanics following it in a mini. And when it inevitably broke, he'd go and pretend to pee in a tree while the two mechanics fixed the car. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> thanks. There are, there are no more questions lined up, but you, you mentioned then you've become involved with the Estimated Owners Club after all this time um, as, a, as a vice president. And... Yeah, I just, I, 
we worked at it, the four of us who were VPs. Then Mr. Archer got assigned to the thing. I mean, was kind of donated to us. Uh, and I remember his father because I talked to his father in 1982 at, uh, when Ford had the company. He kind of interviewed me, but like the letter from, uh, uh, come on, the German guy who ran the company for 15 years we got. So like that letter, I had no contact at all with the Aston Martin Owners Club, and I checked with, uh, with Alan Curtis a week ago, and he doesn't remember any contact. So I had nothing to do with the Aston Martin Owners Club. I joined this thing after all of the problems of copying machines and everything else. This was all, you know, the vote had finally been counted. So I started from scratch. And I didn't want to go back to the past because I wasn't part of it. And frankly, I don't like the past very much anyway. Uh, I've got too much of it and too short a future. So we reached some conclusions. But I've never heard of a committee of management. I mean, I've never heard of the phrase before I got involved. I've heard of management committees. I've heard of executive committees. Uh, I'm sorry, but I have to say it because it sounds like a joke, but it isn't. A committee of management makes me remember that a committee is the kind of group that would organize to try and design a horse and come up with a camel. And frankly, that's what this committee has done. It's just unworkable. You can't lead with an amorphous committee, particularly an amorphous committee of people who over time don't like each other. <laughs> and it's sad because fundamentally, I there's one basic thing. There ought to be one Aston Martin Owners Club, period. And it ought to be based in England because we're the quintessential English company. But it ought to be spun out of, or, or separated from the English club, which then shouldn't have to worry about people in New Zealand voting for whether Ann Reed is a better chairman than uh, Mr. Oates. I mean, that is none of my business. It's not of Ann, you know, it's no business from South Africa. But I think the Americans ought to vote for the American chairman and how that gets divided up. And I don't think that's any matter for the British to worry about. And it would be very easy because you then take in the, you have a couple of rules, which if you want to belong to AMIC, you paid your dues. But if we sent half the dues back to the clubs right off the bat, and then we had a two or three man group running AMIC International and it figured out ways to make a profit, which can be done. I think that international operation could be profitable. At which point it should be shared on a per member basis around the world. And that didn't come from three months of arguing. It came from two weeks of sitting there. I just love to hear somebody come up with a better idea because the maintenance of the current situation just won't work and it will fall apart. And You've read the stuff. I didn't, I thought it was all exaggerated, but it turns out that half the people in Australia aren't paying dues. I mean, they're going to spin off their own club and then there'll be a French club and an English club and, and life will go on and people will still worry about their cars, but you'll never get it back in the box again if you don't do it now. I mean, the idea of basically, and then look, we're supposed to be the revolutionary modernizers. We're 20 years older than the, what is listed as the old guard. Modernizers who are 20 years older than the old guard? I mean, give me a break. The fact of the matter is if you look at the people, they're, post, they're all past chairman, head of concourse, 18 years on uh, you know, the committee of management, you take Mark Donahoe. Uh, if that's your guy's idea of a radical group of revolutionaries overthrowing the proper government, it doesn't look like any revolutionary crowd that I've ever run into. These are just some of the more decent people I've run into. And if it all fails, at least in, during COVID-19, I've ended up with a few new friends, some of whom may really last as friends. But they're good people. They're good people on the other side, too. But unfortunately, uh, you got to pick a side. I mean, 
just trust that group. And then you've got an election coming three months later. Somebody else got a better group of people, put them up as candidates. Put them up with some kind of idea of what that group will do for you that this group won't. And I don't even, I'm not, I, nobody's promised me to be on the new group. Frankly, I'd be pissed off if I wasn't, but anyway, I hope I will be. But the reality is, before we declare this is a revolution, look at the revolutionaries. Uh, to a certain extent, all we're really having is a tea party. The U.S. is saying, without, we're not going to have taxation without representation. And that sees a common position from all the clubs. So figure out how to keep this thing together and then make it more fun. Nobody's, I've never seen such an unhappy group of people. I mean, I shouldn't say, but I called up Mr. Lewington and his eight-year-old had just had a birthday. And he said, my wife is fed up with this. He's, my eight-year-old asked my wife, why is daddy so unhappy? Why is he so mad? And why are we all so unhappy? You want to get up to be unhappy? Volunteer to join the committee of management. Now, I can guarantee you within about three or four months, you can take somebody as cheerful as I am and make them miserable. I don't know quite how it works that way, but it's a guaranteed process. And it's got nothing to do with personalities. I mean, the best people think of ideas and ordinary people think of events. And small minds think of personalities. This is not a personality issue. This is people. And they don't divide into good and bad. But we've got an idea and we have a chance. If we can pass this Articles of Association, and then we put an interim committee together that will do absolutely nothing for three months. And I gather there's even the idea that nobody has to pay dues. And then we wait for three months and we have an election. Then look at the scoundrels who are running and pick the least scoundrelous of the scoundrels. But the reality is that's all that we're talking about is just basically we can't run on the existing Articles of Association unless it stays the same. And if it stays the same, it will fall apart. And it's bankrupt. And I guess uh, not financially, it's mentally bankrupt or organizationally bankrupt. And in this case, I can't ride in on my white horse. I'm 82 years old. It's tough to get the horse to stand still. And uh, anybody just doesn't need a white horse. There's enough white horses involved. Uh, I mean, Richard Jackson, he's head of the club. But, uh, he's gone through a spate of illness. Uh, come on, Michael Urban. Oh my God, there's Peter Saliati. There's a, a revolutionary force from Australia, you know, threatening to do battle. I mean, look at what you're stuck with. You're stuck with us. And I hope to be part of us. But I can promise you if I get a chance, it will happen and it will work. And you'll be happy. Because that's, I, I frankly would like to be rid of this problem and the easiest way to get rid of this problem is the secret i had for rescuing aston when you get to some place find the brightest people find a common idea they all agree to set a goal and then get out of the way and frankly that's how this club ought to run just there are lots of good people but and they're in operations and what have you. We never get around to talking about operations. I don't know what we argue about, but I've been learning more about stuff that I want to know nothing about than almost any time in my life. So if I've entertained you, give me my freedom back and vote for the AGM. I mean, just vote for some kind of a change because nobody is out there saying how wonderful it is right now. If anybody wants to speak up and answer that question, if anybody thinks everybody's happy at the com and if the modernizers would go away and we could go back to the past and live happily ever after, that's not the way the fairy tale works. 
Peter, that sounds like uh, sounds like some sage advice and uh, and, a, and a virtual white horse. I see Nigel Button's got his hand up and has done for a while. So Nigel, do you want to go ahead? You have you have a question? You need to be, we need to unmute you. So Nigel, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Is that it? I think yep. so. Go ahead. Right. This is my first Zoom meeting. <clears throat> Peter. <Okay>. Welcome. <laughs> this is not a question, it's just to say hello. After 40 years, because you hired me in 1976 as Director of Finance. <laughs> you don't recognize me because I've got a lot less hair than I had in those days. <laughs> <laughs> the same amount of teeth, but less hair. And I will also note that um, Jan Dowman is there as well. And I think it was Jan who mentioned to you that he knew somebody who was a chartered accountant who might be able to help you rescue or set up Aston Martin. That doesn't mean that it was Jan's idea that I should become financial director. You did actually go through Peter Sober and have an interview process. And something like 150 people were interviewed. But yet, somehow, I managed to hang in there. And at the Georgester Hotel, we first met, I believe. And I think you, you <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> offered me the job, and it was one of those job offers that you cannot refuse. So thank you very much for five years, five, five very interesting years, which from which I don't think I've, I've recovered. And the reason why I say that is because I bought a DB4 in 1978 for a thousand pounds. It came into the workshop and the, uh, the owner was Commercial Union. And they asked the uh, service manager, who was was name I can't remember now. Um, they asked him to find a buyer, and so he came to see me and said, um, "Nigel, you're looking for a DB4 or DB5. Um, how about this one?" So I said, "Yes, why not?" It was very badly damaged, and I stored it for 13 years before paying to get it rebuilt for a sum total of around about 40,000 pounds. <clears throat> Something like one eighth of what you might have to spend now. Anyhow. Well, Nigel, <laughs> you, you certainly didn't get the, we weren't paying anybody enough at Aston to afford to fix a DB4. Certainly not today. I guess you should have done That's it right. 10 days. Right. You could have made a deal on the side if you, <laughs> one way or another. Did you remember, did Alan, did Alan Curtis ever get a proper Aston? I don't, um, no, I don't think he did. No, no, he tried. <laughs> I mean, he drove V8, he drove the Volante. He probably took took the Lagonda home as well once or twice. But he had a hand in in commenting on whether the cars were customer friendly or not. And I do remember he had a stream that he had to go through to get to his house. And every car that he returned was filthy, dirty. Oh, well. Anyhow. Listen, just send me a note. I'm Peter at Sprague.com. I'd love to just correspond a little. And it, uh, I mean, Philip played such an important role. And he's, I talk to Philip all the time. He's an investor in my latest company. And uh, believe it or not, we're going to, he has a short term horizon because uh, I'm 82. So my, <laughs> We don't have a 20 year plan. We have a five year plan, <laughs> but it'd be fun to find out what happened and just get in touch. I'm, I don't know whether you're on LinkedIn, but I'm Peter at Sprague.com. And yeah, it's wonderful worked, to see you. I worked, I worked when um, Fred Hartley left. Excuse me? Do you remember Fred Hartley? Oh, sure. Yeah, when he left, mm -hmm. Alan just took over the running of the company. And he and I worked very closely together for about 
two or three years until you recruited a new chief executive. Yeah, nobody, I, I should have put more of that in it. I mean, Alan drove, what was it, about an hour to work in the morning? He flew. Well, he, he flew when he flew. could, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you fly with him? No, no, I never did. I never flew with him. But um, he it didn't me to Compton Abbas. And I was taken up in his single engine aircraft. And I felt very uncomfortable. I prefer four wheels than <laughs> a single engine and a, two wings. Uh, I, Alan uh, occasionally frightened uh, attractive young ladies by taking them upside down and right side up and <laughs> doing loops and spins. Anyway, this is what, uh, I don't know whether you can see that, but this is what I'm building now. Right. It's electronic. Yeah. And it weighs a little over an ounce. And it's basically a badge that if you were in a hospital, I could talk to you if you were deaf. It also says 50 languages. So I can say, hi, you guys. Thank you for coming. And let's get on with it. But anyway, that's my latest gadget. If you go to Sprague.com, we built it in the last two years. And I've got patents 13 and 14 on this one. And uh, got to have something to do in your day job. And uh, it, if I were just on the committee of management, I would uh, probably have shortened my lifespan by some appreciable length. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I don't know where you're all coming from on that. I wish I could hear from. Yeah, I, I, I come from the other side. <laughs> this is if this is Anders. Can you hear me? I is can. It, okay. This is, uh, you and I met 10 days ago, but we met 30 years ago as well. Uh, and we're having lunch next week. But I, this was very interesting to hear the history, uh, which I knew, you know, a fair amount about. Um, I've owned my DB5 for 20 years and I've really enjoyed the people I've met. It's kept in France, but it has British plates. And I've done a number of rallies and I was, um, I think it's a wonderful club which needs exactly what you're suggesting. So you have my full support for, uh, you know, putting together these. Uh, I never believed in a committee of management. That I think is the worst possible thing you could have. So you you have my vote. You know to make these changes for sure. Well, thank you very much, Anders, and we have to decide where we're having lunch, so it's Tuesday. I, I was suggesting the New York Yacht Club, which is a little different. I know it very, very well, and I, uh, I started the American Sailing Association 35 years ago. So, yeah. uh, and we have 13,000 members and have certified a million people. Yeah. So I have occasionally gone there. So uh, I sailed 12 <laughs> meters uh, up in Newport, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, Oops. Sorry, my phone is ringing. Well, it'll be great fun. I've never, I've been on 12 meters, but I've never, I don't sail. I ride on other people's boats. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad way to do it. Anyway, I'm looking forward to see you on Tuesday. Okay. I look forward as well. Thank you. I, I want to hear something negative. I mean, there's got to be somebody out there who thinks what we're doing is crazy or difficult or impossible or Please, I mean, but, uh, there are no hands up, Peter. So no, I've got a hand up. Can you see me? Oh, Richard oh. Davies. please speak. I can't see you, but go ahead. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, just disagree with what, what you said, Mr. Sprague, about the rearrangement of the club, because I think that uh, the, the way that the people who are trying to make all these changes uh, is that very much not, not in, in the interest of club. Of the club, and particularly when uh, we think that, uh, that one of the people who was involved with it uh, was put, putting out these pre filled proxy forms um, about 12 months ago, I think it was. And if we're going to get the new committee of management, or whatever it's going to be called, of, of about seven people, it's going to be a very concentrated um, uh, number of people 
in, in power, as it were, who, who will have a lot of, a, a, a great deal of power because there doesn't seem to be any allowance for proxy voting or for people who are not physically at a meeting uh, to, to have their, their say. And this strikes me as being very anti-democratic. Um, and I think that if uh, we have people who went to law, as, as we saw, um, were roundly criticised by the judge, if we have people like that in charge of the club, I think that will be a very bad uh, day for the way that the club is run. And I will feel extremely unhappy about that. And I, I suspect that a lot of other members will too. And we may see that uh, the, the membership, just some of the members disappear. And the club as we know it, uh, which really is, it's, it's supposed to be a car club for fun, run by volunteers, by, by well, amateurs, if you like, but run, certainly run by volunteers. Um, and I think the whole nature of the club is likely to be changed for the worse. So I'm certainly going to vote against what you have been suggesting. Or I'm, well, I'm sorry, but the, the club, as you know it, there's no reason the British club, I don't know whether you've traveled very much abroad, but there's no much, the British club continues on. It may continue on with its current chairman. It continues on running its affairs. Uh, it might not run France. The, it might for budgetary reasons, instead of spending 45,000 pounds, going to Le Mans Classic, we might ask the French club to do an Amok 10 and we can save 35 of the 45,000 pounds. But the reality is the English club runs its own events and it does all those things and it will continue to. Well, it, in one form or another, yes. But I don't it's not going to run Lime Rock and it's not going to run the stuff that engages. I mean, poor Australia is 3,000 miles from one end to the other and they're divided into segments because Perth doesn't talk to uh, to uh, Sydney very often. I mean, whatever it is, I don't see that the English club would change at all. It can keep its own management. They may have a smaller budget. Oh, but, probably will. But, it, but it will also be run by far fewer people. Uh, and I don't necessarily think that that's a great idea, depending on what their views are. But we've seen a little bit of the character of some of the people who are likely to be running the club if these changes go ahead. And I feel very unhappy about people who go to law and then get criticised as um, thoroughly as the, the, the people who were criticised. Are they fit people to run the Aston Martin Owners Club? Not in my view. Uh, but Richard, they, Richard first, who you're talking about, basically has said that he is not going to stand for the modernizers committee. I've spent a lot of time on the phone with him. He makes a great deal of sense. I don't know what frustrated him to that level. As I started off the conversation, I've never sued anybody. It doesn't really work. I can only comment that it was so frustrating to watch an election take place where nobody revealed the votes. I have no idea. The last time that was pulled off was by uh, a man I truly dislike, Mr former President Trump, who tried to do that in Georgia. He said, we, we're not going to, uh, I, I don't like the fact I lost by 12,000 votes, so we're going to cancel the election. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, I don't mean to draw a direct comparison, but that happened three months before. Mm -hmm. I didn't sue anybody. Richard, who I think has many valuable ideas, but in order not to be a lightning rod in this process, has basically said, I'm not going to run. So you're just going to have to put up with a Richard Firstless organization. But, but we, we may not start first, but we won't end last. I mean, one way or another, uh, he's not going to be there. But I, but I don't see the English club changing. It's going to still meet at the barn. You, you can look at the people, but they, they're two different organizations. I don't see the international club running the English club any more than I see it running the French club or the Kuwaiti club. I don't think, I don't think it needs to. But I think one of the one of the problems is that if we're not going to be able to have proxy voting and people voting who are not actually at the, the meeting, then th this is not a very democratic way to run a club, is it? It's a is terrible it? business proxy voting. It's also what's in the Articles of Association right now. Yeah. Uh, also, frankly, when those were written in 1972, the last variant, or I guess the new variant in 2000 something, uh, Zoom didn't exist. No. no. I mean, realize this meeting wouldn't exist. I mean, at some point when you talk about modernizers, <laughs> uh, don't throw everybody out who 
can't manage to find themselves to the barn every time we have to have a meeting. I mean, we're going to be Zooming for the rest of our lives. Unfortunately, with COVID, on today's news, it looks like we're going to have COVID for the rest of our lives. Probably, yeah. But I suggest we Zoom in real life and Zoom in your cars. But the reality is uh, the international club is not going to run the English club, period. We're going to go away. Mr. Saglietti doesn't get a vote on the next election on the English club. Yeah. Just run your own affairs and let let us go. But right now, uh, I'm not interested in throwing all that tea into the harbor. Okay. All I'm okay. saying is I, I'm disagreeing with, you, with your point of view and trying to put, put my point across. I don't want to take everybody else's time up with this because I expect there are a number of people with one view or another. And we were here really to talk about cars, which is far more interesting. Can I put a question to you, please, about what you... Yes, of course. Uh, you, you talked very interestingly about Bulldog, and I've seen various suggestions that the company at one stage was proposing to build a run of 25 of them, but only ever completed one. Is, is that true, or, or was it never for sale, never going to be for sale? Uh, Mark, did you hear that better? We were proposing to build what? To, what was there a proposal? No, Mark, Mark I, <laughs> I'm reading your name. Rich. <laughs> Richard, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, did you hear that clearly? Yes, so, so if, I'm, if my mic's any clearer, Richard was asking whether the plan to build 25 Bulldogs was ever a realistic plan, or was it really just a one-off as turned out to be the case, if I can paraphrase you, Richard? Yeah, absolutely right, thank you. If it had five, the answer is I, one don't know. Uh, and now that's never really stopped me from talking. If it had been a great success, if we'd had enough orders, if we'd had the guts to do what the new club does, which is charge two and a half million dollars for a car, at a price, we would have built anything. Yeah. And so, you know, we could have turned his Woody into a shooting break, but uh, it seems a little pretentious there being few Woodies on estate properties that don't have grouse. But uh, anyway, uh, the answer is the right price we would have built it. Uh, I don't remember the conversation. Hmm. And uh, it may, clearly, if we'd had enough orders at the right price, we were Aston Martin Lagonda. We build what the customer wants. We would have built it. Okay, thank you. Okay. But, thank you. Thank and I'm you. glad there's somebody from the opposition because there's got to have an opposition to have a debate. But anyway, have a glass of wine, which I'm about to do. And uh, uh, I'm afraid it's my bedtime here in England. It's, uh... yeah, think about the dreadful people who are proposing to be the renegades that overthrow the establishment, except we're not overthrowing the establishment. The establishment is going to be there, but we don't have a little tiny establishment that basically keeps this club together because Ferrari's falling apart, Jaguar's falling apart, every club has fallen apart. Mm. Wouldn't it be fun if we were the one that didn't fall apart? Yeah, I'm all for that. And I just think it's very, very important because I, I thought everybody was exaggerating because everything in the comm is exaggerated when they said this is falling apart. But I've now talked, incidentally, you want people who, are, are, the guy who gave me this job was Bob Welch in Boston. He was a psychologist and he's probably concluded I'm crazy. But whatever the problem is, he doesn't agree with me. And he gave me the job and damn it all, you give me a job and I work at it for five or six months. Hmm. Uh, don't just disagree with me, come up with a better idea or tell me why I'm wrong. Otherwise, I did the best I could. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I like people on both sides, but not to be totally dishonest. I like the people on my side a little better. <laughs> Our side, I should say. To which I also have to thank uh, God. Thank you, Andrew, for doing what you've done. Uh, I'm glad to see the remark. I let. There are a couple of other things I would do in the club. If I were on this international amok, I wouldn't send you a happy birthday card with four pages, or four paragraphs of, of legal nonsense announcing that I'm not within violation of Her Majesty's laws that you can't read this if you are the recipient and you're not really the recipient, you have to destroy it before you read it. 
I mean, come on, guys. Uh, I haven't discovered in my five months or my five years a secret, a secret worth keeping. Plus, the fact is, everybody knows the secret is only capable of being kept provided you don't tell anybody. Three people, you broadcast it. Those things I'd love to see gone, unless people enjoy it. Why the hell is it so? What what secrets are we beholding? I mean, in my Yale class, we've got everybody this year's email. I think we could ask people, do you want to share your email? And if you say yes, fine. And if you don't include it, it's because you either don't share it or you don't have an email. But why am I? I'm not worried about your privacy. I'm worried about the future and having fun. And I would like to go to Melbourne and see somebody. I'd like to be able to easily find Nigel Button's email without having to beg for it. And I don't like begging. I mean, let's just open this thing up. And that's all that I'm talking about. But I don't see that the English club, I don't see any particular reason why the current I still think they have to go to a smaller group than six, you know, than 20 people. But I see no reason why they can't pick their own chairman. They can pick their own smaller group. I would recommend a smaller group because I've never heard of 20 people functioning, doing anything. Somewhere along the line, you have to pick the hill you're going to climb. You can't have 20 people at the bottom of the hill debating which hill they're going to climb. Somebody has got to get out front. And we got some very good people and you can get up to five or six. We were, I was on the board of National Semiconductor for 30 years. I think I'm the second longest serving board member and the other guy had his father's name on the company. And we started off with a three person board. It was fine until we got to about six. It got fairly unwieldy when we got to nine. I mean, this is just organizational behavior. Three was really fun because it was the CEO of the company and me and a guy named Don Whedon. So when we wanted to discuss management performance, we recommended that the CEO take a hike. And while he was gone, we had a management performance review. At which point after he'd taken a hike, he came back and he's the man who built the company. He almost always got a very good performance review, which we also didn't write down. And we didn't min it. And it's not part of the record. We just kept the company together and it ended up being an $8 billion company and was sold to Texas Instruments. We had 20,000 people. Uh, we spent half an hour at the comm reviewing what we didn't accomplish at the last comm with documents. I mean, come on. <laughs> Let me out of this trap, guys. <laughs> Okay, then on, on the note of let me out of this, there are no, uh, there are no further questions uh, queuing up. Um, I know we've, we've had uh, one, one for and one against in terms of the, the EGM business. We've had plenty of questions about to the history of Aston Martin, which of course is what this whole session was, was predominantly about. Thank, thank you, Peter, for, uh, for telling us. I, I remember when my phone rang a few months ago and it, and it, and it said, Peter Sprague is, is wanting to speak to you. And I thought, I sort, of, I, I, I sort of jumped to attention. I thought, what on earth does Peter Sprague want with me? And then uh, about 40 minutes later, I'd been uh, educated, entertained uh, and, and amused. Uh, and, and I hope you have been too this evening. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you to you for, for, join, for, for joining us. Uh, and I just want to leave with one quote from the very beginning of this session, Peter, which is where you said, I got caught by the Russians and that was fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was with a bunch. Of, actually, go read the story. It's in Spreger.com. It, it, uh, the funniest part of it was that it, uh, it actually involved a drink. Uh, I was 17 at the time, and I was in a convoy of people who were trying to get out, including four French race car drivers and some diplomats and their children. And we were stuck in a gymnasium on the border, surrounded by three Russian tanks with a Russian with a machine gun in every room. And I didn't have any documentation because I walked in illegally. Uh, I didn't walk in illegally. There was no border at the time. The Hungarians were in charge. And there were about six journalists, and I wanted to be one of them. And they were sitting in front of a big uh, Hungarian porcelain stove, 
sharing a bottle of scotch. And one was a combat photographer named Michael Rougier, and another was Catherine Clark and her husband. And I went over and I said, I'm a minor, but I'm a minor in a major situation and I need a drink. And they said, kid, you get this fire started. It was snowing outside. It was early November, late October, and it was cold. You get this fire going, you can have anything you want. So I figured out that the coal was in the basement and I got into the basement and I just kind of ignored the guards and I came up with the coal and I got the fire started. At which point I got to sit and drink scotch with the boys. So I'm now a member of the club because that's what you had to do to join the club. 10 years later, a guy named Frank, and I got written up by one of the journalists is a heroic young American who under the guns of Russians got a fire going to keep small children from freezing. Yeah. About 10 years later, I got a note from a guy who had been on that same bench. He said, I'm a minor, but I'm a minor in a major situation. And I need a drink. If those words mean anything to you, you're the Petersburg I remember. And I'd like to see you again. And I was going to Iran and I figured I'd call him when I got back. He committed suicide in the three weeks I was gone. Anybody who ever had contact with who does that, it's a terrible experience. But I didn't actually start the fire to keep little children from freezing. I didn't give a hoot about the little children. I gave a hoot about having a scotch and joining a club. And I got scotch and I joined the club. So that's the end of my horrible experience being a prisoner of the Soviet Union. <laughs> On that thought, let's end the session. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody else, for joining us. Thank you. It's recorded, as I mentioned, and it will be available to download or to see again soon. Good night, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys.